This is China and the World, hosted by Asia Society Switzerland. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the fifth episode of China and the World, where we are looking at the evolving role of China in different regions and countries. I'm your host, Nico Lopsinga. Today, we will talk about China's relationship with Russia, its big neighbor to the north. We'll discuss the rapprochement of the two countries since the 1980s, what impact the 2014 Crimea annexation had, and how Central Asia is affected by a closer Sino-Russian relationship. The relationship between China and Russia has seen its highs and lows. The countries cooperated quite closely in the early years of the PRC, with the Soviet Union providing abundant assistance to China. However, they were locked in a diplomatic stalemate for much of the 1960s and 70s over differences concerning ideology and territory. The rapprochement in bilateral ties came in the late 1980s, when then-Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev visited China and met with then-Chinese leader Deng Xiaoping. That meeting is seen as a symbol of the normalization of the Sino-Russia relationship. Ever since the disintegration of the Soviet Union in 1991, ties between China and Russia steadily developed. There is an increased interest in China nowadays among younger generations of Russians and an awareness that China forms part of the future. And an older generation in Russia sees in China what could have become of the Soviet Union, says Alex Gabuev. I don't think that there is an admiration uh, of China. There, are, there is admiration in pockets of the China, of the Russian society, and it goes back to this narrative and myth that, oh, China actually is a reformed Soviet Union. So had Gorbachev not pursued perestroika and glasses, had he pursued market reforms, uh, we could still be the powerful Soviet Union, uh, but our system would be married with a state-led capitalism. And I think that informs a lot of discussions here. People who dream of going back and to take the like, uh, clock, uh, the time machine uh, back and come to the glorious days of the Soviet Union, or people in the security establishment, friends of Putin who run large and powerful state-owned enterprises who use this narrative to justify state control over the economy and like the source of their personal wealth, they point out to China as a successful model. Mm -hmm. So there is a stream in the lead that says that's the way to go. Alex Gabuev is a senior fellow and the chair of the Russia in the Asia Pacific program at the Carnegie Moscow Center. His research focuses on Russia's policy towards East and Southeast Asia, political and ideological trends in China, and China's relations with its neighbors, especially those in Central Asia. He has witnessed a change in perception towards China in Russia himself, as he told me in a discussion back in April 2020. I think that's very visible that you see there is an interest in Chinese culture, in Chinese language. Uh, there are thousands of younger Russians who learn Chinese. Like when I started to learn Mandarin back in 2002, uh, that was already picking up, but that was not the fanciest thing to do. And then by the year, uh, by the time I graduated from Moscow State in 2007, that was already kind of pretty visible. And like right now, after the global credit crunch 2008, 2009, well, uh, Russian GDP has experienced a nosedive of roughly 9%. And Chinese GDP has grown roughly by 10%. Uh, that was a big kind of awakening moment for the Russian elite and for the Russian population that China's arrival to the world stage is real. It's big. It's happening next door. And it's not only about a giant market of very poor Chinese uh, rice paddlers who just try migrate to, to the cities in order to work there. Like that's the image of many people of Putin's generation, uh, their image of China, which was really rooted in the Soviet experience of helping uh, China to build up the backbone of its industries or infrastructure. Uh, the Russians understand now that at least there is a second alternative source of with smart investment, technology, and stuff. Russia has been historically exposed to European, particularly German technology, and now China can play a similar role. So that's a big shift that really takes many years to absorb and digest. And I, I don't think that 
uh, it provides you a lot of comfort if you are, let's say, Vladimir Putin or people of his generation. They're still very kind of rooted in uh, European narrative of Russian culture. Uh, so are many compatriots, but I think that there is this increasing pragmatic awakening that, hey, China might be not the only future, but China definitely is part of this future. And uh, we should learn the language, we should understand this culture, we should be much more exposed. As China increases its power and moves westwards, Russia is looking more to the east. In 2014, Russian special forces occupied Ukraine's Crimean Peninsula, following a power struggle of different factions within the Ukraine. As a result of the annexation, Russia has faced sanctions from the West. The Crimea annexation, therefore, has often been described as the starting point of Russia's pivots to China. But as Alex Gabuev points out, the Russian turn to the East predates the annexation of Crimea and runs much, much deeper. I think that the trends driving the two countries uh, closer together uh, have predated the Crimean crisis. Uh, and I would name only three. One of them is the border. That's really the second largest, uh, longest border for Russia, except for the border of Kazakhstan, which is member of the customs union and a treaty ally. So the measures in terms of customs control, border control, security there are, are relaxed. It's much more porous than border with uh, any European nation or uh, with China for that matter. Uh, but that's been a source of major uh, challenges, uh, military challenges during the sign of Soviet split. And same goes for China, which has been historically obsessed with a threat coming from the North. Uh, and once there was an opportunity to improve the relationship, uh, close the chatter of historic arguments and territorial disputes and demilitarize the border in order to use resources elsewhere, like for China in the 80s, that was economic modernization and then really a military focus on Taiwan, South China Sea and other priority areas where Russia remained obsessed with NATO enlargement. Uh, both leaderships jumped on this opportunity under Gorbachev and Deng Xiaoping in late 80s. And basically, uh, all the following generations of leaders, Jiang Zemin, Hu Jintao, uh, Xi Jinping on the Chinese side, and then Yeltsin and Putin on the Russian side, have basically stayed on track. So military uh, standstill, demilitarization of the border is one of the areas where they cooperate and they need each other strongly. So that's one. Two is really a um, very complementary nature of the economies. Russia is a big exporter of commodities, particularly oil and gas. China is a big buyer uh, and a, well, one of the major driver of global consumption. Uh, so historically, Russia has been putting a lot of eggs in U European basket for that because all of the infrastructure linking Russia to global markets was going to Europe. China became net oil importer only in 1994. So that was a natural trend for Russia to rebalance its dependency on Europe and to try to shift some of production in Siberia to its neighbor, China, just to try to move the two cows, let's say. And there was a big potential for that. And point number three, uh, both countries are claimed to be democracy. That's at least what's written in the Russian constitution. That's what's written in the Chinese constitution. That is a socialist democracy with Chinese characteristics. In reality, neither is a democracy. And that brings two important aspects here. One is that they have a lot of psychological comfort talking to each other. Like why would Vladimir Putin ever bring labor camps uh, or concentration camps in Xinjiang? Why would uh, Xi Jinping brought up uh, in public persecution of gay people in Chechnya, right? Uh, so there is a lot of psychological comfort of talking to each other. And two, when it comes to global governance domains, like issue, uh, like management of the internet or data localization standards, Russia and China are in the same boat. So this domestic policy, security, and economic dimension were driving the free the two countries closer together regardless. But then came Crimea annexation and the sanctions. And Russia was looking that it's in the midst of big financial hit. It's very exposed to Western technology, Western credit and Western investment. And it needs to replace that. Where does it go? Europe is part of the sanctions coalition. Japan, South Korea are allies of the United States. 
And then that's only one big door to knock on, and that's China. The relationship has grown closer also on a personal level. Russian President Vladimir Putin and Chinese leader Xi Jinping share quite a few personal traits. But there is a natural limit to how close the relationship can go, says Alex Gabuev. Both Putin and Xi have, uh, are feeling this historic mission. It's very interesting that two are age mates. Uh, Xi Jinping is just six uh, months younger. They share a lot of commonalities in their experience, like their fathers fought in World War II, they have hardships in their youth, and both want to make their countries great again. So that's, I think, a layer which provides a lot of commonalities between the, between the systems. Point number two is that, uh, yes, fight against the West is very important. And uh, it's particularly visible when we come to this uh, global for us like UN or discussions about freedom of expression on the internet versus sovereignty on the internet. That's where Russia and China are in the same boat. Uh, but how close can you come to each other when your political philosophy and ideology is based on the notion of sovereignty? Uh, I think that both have, the, there, there is a certain limit. So they are ready to support each other to protect their sovereignty uh, in the global domain. But when it comes to sovereignty, I think that there are certain limits on how actually close you can integrate opposed to the integration among uh, allies of the United States. With two proud leaders so intent on preserving their sovereignty, it is perhaps no surprise that despite all the reasons for the two countries to collaborate more closely, there is, and maybe always will be, a measure of lingering mistrust. Here's Alex. In Russia, before Putin went to Shanghai in May 2014 and signed this big gas pipeline deal, Power of Siberia, which will link two new gas fields in eastern Siberia to Chinese consumers, uh, that pipeline was commissioned end of 2019 and is now kind of reaching full capacity. Uh, what predated that was a pretty meticulous by Russian standard analysis of risks uh, of partnering with China, because definitely the relationship didn't yield as much as would, you would normally expect. Like there are two giant neighbors uh, with really complementary economic structure. Like why are they not uh, trading much more than they do? Why uh, there is not that much Chinese investment in Russia? Like why uh, is this uh, relationship always underperforming the way you would assume it should perform? And the reasons for that have been that, yes, despite uh, the uh, closing of this historic chapter in terms of uh, territorial dispute officially, there were always lingering suspicions on the Russian side. Like there was a rising giant that we don't know well, that we don't understand well, uh, that might become uh, very assertive going forward. And uh, look just at the map. Like we are exposed to this very long continental map with uh, uh, 120 million people just across the border in a couple of neighboring provinces and just 6 million of Russians and shrinking uh, on the Russian side. Oh, that's challenging. So what about influx of Chinese migration, exploitation of Russian natural resources? What about arms sales? Like Russian military industrial complex has survived in the 90s by selling a lot of weapons to China because like all of the other customers, including the Red Army, have basically collapsed and went bust. Uh, so up to 50% of Russia's hardware exports in, uh, in arms uh, was going to China in 1990s. And like, oh, but why are we grooming a powerful army next door, right? So is that challenging? Uh, we probably should, should stop doing this. And then uh, it's known that Chinese have copied some of the Russian hardware in order to make their own indigenous indigenous uh, aircraft and stuff. And then point number three was always competition in Central Asia. So Russia has gone through all of these three areas and established that, hey, this risk either are outdated or these are the risks where Russia cannot do much. Like Chinese population in the Far East is not that visible. There are about 200,000 people max for the whole of Siberia. And it's shrinking because Chinese economies grow much faster and there are much many more labor employment opportunities in China. 
uh, with military equipment, well, China hasn't invested so much money into that, that in 10 years' time, uh, it will do fine without Russian equipment. And we probably have just a window of opportunity in the Chinese market. And in Central Asia, the economic competition there is just not possible for Russia because China uh, has the same economic structure uh, and the same matches between economic structure of Central Asian states and China. They are just natural naturally complementary, whereas Russia is their direct competitor in uh, commodities markets. There's this lingering mistrust, and as you've mentioned, it's come up uh, during the current crisis uh, very strongly. Let's look at it from the other side. So how does China, how do Chinese officials see Russia? What's in it for China? Why would they want a closer relationship, but also where would they maybe be skeptical? I think that the security dimension plays a major role here. So China, uh, Russia as part of a coalition of countries that are China skeptical or want to contain China. Uh, Russia is, that is closely allied to NATO or has a, a robust relationship with Japan that covers security, that's a strategic nightmare uh, for historical reasons and for reasons that China doesn't enjoy friendship of many of its neighbors. If you look around the map, there are not that many countries who live next door to China that generally like the Chinese. So if Russia joins a camp of kind of China skeptics or its foreign policy is more aligned with foreign policy of the U.S. amid growing strategic competition between the U.S. and China, that's a nightmare. So the price that you want to pay in order to keep Russia at least neutral or better still more aligned to you than to your strategic competitor is a big benefit in itself. So I think that's number one, number two, number three of why Russia is important for China. When we come to number uh, four, there is something unique that China can get only from Russia and not from elsewhere, and that's the arms. Uh, yes, China has invested a lot and has very um, improving our military R&D capacity. And like, we see that, that a lot of what's going on is not just stealth of technologies from elsewhere, but it's indigenous. But in some areas, Russia still maintains superiority and China needs those capabilities right now because of South China Sea and because of intensifying confrontation with the US. And this covers aircraft, this covers surface to air missiles, and that's where Russia really comes to provide this to China. And I think that you ask, okay, what are the testaments that this partnership is improving over the course of the last five years? Well, Russia was reluctant to sell its most sophisticated weaponry to China just a decade ago. And after Crimea, it started to sell SU-35, the most sophisticated Russian fighter jet, and S-400, uh, like the surface-to-air missiles to China, and China, in fact, became the first overseas buyers of those cutting-edge uh, Russian technologies. And then last year, Putin has revealed that China is helping, that Russia is helping China to build its uh, military uh, missile attack uh, warning system. So that's a system of radar that can warn you if your adversary launches a full-scale nuclear attack on your territory and gives you additional time to figure out your response. And that's a critical component of a full-fledged nuclear deterrent. So China is developing its nuclear arsenal, but doesn't have this really sophisticated part of a nuclear deterrent. And it's Russia that's helping China sharing its technology with the Chinese. So I think that's very important. And then uh, Russia is one of the sources of commodities. China can buy commodities elsewhere, it's true, and it's very visible in the Middle East, Africa, Latin America. But these commodities are across the border. Uh, what links uh, China to the deposits of hydrocarbons in Siberia are pipelines that are, so it's not uh, tankers that run through the sea avenues controlled by U.S. fleet, and that gives them kind of uh, additional security guarantees. And there is a lot of stuff that China is eager to, to invest in Russian exploit in terms of natural resources. Russia is somewhat of a market. Uh, it's not a super big market, but it is still a market if you figure in all of the members of the Eurasian Economic Union, 170 million. Uh, that's enough. And then I think what's the most like increasingly important right now 
is that Russia and its neighbors in Central Asia are the only place where China can really hope to impose its technological standards in 5G and uh, in finance in many, in many areas because of Russia's schism with the West. Uh, and I think that if China can prove and can embed Russia into its Beijing-centered normative order and technological order, I think that plays a bigger role in China's competition overall. Because yes, you can do something in Ecuador or in weaker states in Africa that that matters for something. But then, if you if you have Russia happy with Huawei technology, you can come to Brazil. You can come to many countries in between that are not allied to the U.S. But you say, hey. If proud and powerful Russia doesn't see Huawei as a problem, why should you? So that's that's also very important for the Chinese. Of course, China is not only a lot bigger than Russia in terms of its population; its economy has also been growing much faster than Russia's, making the relationship increasingly asymmetric. I've asked Alex if both countries were aware of that fact. I think that Russian leadership are no fools, and definitely it's acutely felt in Moscow. So its relationship is asymmetric, and that's increasingly asymmetric because uh, China power, uh, China's power is continuing to increase. Where Russia, well, has uh, carved back some of the influence of the Soviet Union, but it definitely doesn't have the sustainable economic base and like knowledge base. In order to catapult itself in the first tier of global powers like the U.S. or China, for that matter,、um, I think that overall the Russians are looking at this longer term, and they ask themselves, "Okay, where do you、uh, look for symmetry? Is Germany's relationship with the U.S. equal, symmetrical? Like、uh, there is no symmetry even among closest allies." and Yes, we all know that the stronger partner, even in a closer relationship, sometimes uses this dependency or asymmetry as a leverage.、Uh, there is no ally. There is a big gap in values between Russia and China. I think that Russia is totally aware that at some point China might use its stronger position as a leverage. In order to pressurize Russia, in order to do things that Russia wouldn't do under normal circumstances,、uh, trade away some of the technologies that Russia doesn't still want to share,、uh, sell stakes in some of the strategic oil and gas fields, or support China in、um, global disputes that Russia doesn't want to be part of, like. For example, South China Sea, where China is arguing with Vietnam, which is also an important partner for Russia in Asia. So Russia might be forcing to choose into side with China more than it wants to. So for Russia, the task is really to achieve an equilibrium and try to balance growing Chinese influence with exposure to other parties, and also become a more self-reliant. Economy that China's power is not as towering.、Uh, that's the problem because I think that Russia was overly exposed to the West in the previous decade, and、uh, the allied or closer partnership didn't happen for a variety of reasons, and it won't happen probably.、Uh, so, Ch- pivot to China was a way, a reflection of the, yeah, we should connect to the growing、uh, pole in international relations, and we were stupid. Uh, for not doing so, like two decades back, so we have to catch up quickly.、Uh, but then,、uh, okay, does it impose additional risks to us? So Russia has to find its balance, which is hindered definitely by the level of very bitter、uh, confrontation between Russia and the U.S. and other European states. And then the state of modernization.、Uh, In Russia is also very deplorable. So there are longer-term questions whether Russia can fix its own problems that are not part of its geopolitical competition with anybody else, right?、Mm-hmm. Uh, so China here, in a way, becomes an indispensable partner because Russia has no many, too many doors to knock on. With all that in mind, it seems likely that the Sino-Russian relationship. While complicated and sometimes fraught, we'll get closer in the coming years. 
And that dynamic has an influence on the rest of the world, perhaps most pronounced in Central Asia, where many countries share a border with both Russia and China. I've asked Alex Gabuev if a closer Russia-China relationship will put these countries in a better or in a more difficult position. I think they will be in a, a more difficult position. And whenever I travel to Central Asia, uh, I feel that talking to senior officials. Because their game has been historically since uh, independence uh, is really trying to put eggs in different baskets. And they would love to have a basket called uh, the West, but they know that it's really far away. The U.S. presence there was justified by the campaign in Afghanistan. And uh, the West doesn't have too many resources to really provide an alternative. So it's really a very uh, sophisticated balancing act between China and Russia. As soon as Russia becomes a junior partner in this relationship, and China becomes not only the towering economic presence, but also Russia might allow China to become a towering security presence or don't have too many tools to push back, then this game is over uh, in a way, and uh, China really becomes the hegemon uh, in the region. So uh, I think that Russian leadership is aware of that, uh, and the local uh, leaders are really aware of that. So there is a desire to build stronger, stronger bonds with Russia. Problems with that has been definitely brought by Crimea annexation. So if Russia can chop off part of the territory of its neighbor and violate the agreements and pledges it has made once the Soviet Union has been dissolved, why should Kazakhstan feel secure about its northern parts, which are kind of predominantly Russian speaking? And I, I don't think that uh, northern Kazakhstan is under any real threat of Russian aggression, but Russia has not come up in kind of publicly or privately expressing and explaining that what happened in Crimea was a unique uh, political crisis and that's really about NATO enlargement and it's not about just really a desire to chop off every Russian populated part of former Soviet Union. So I think that complicates a lot options for these countries and unfortunately they have to put increasing number of acts in the basket China. And then I think COVID brings this element of rush against the clock. We need to save our economies. We need to find new markets. We need to get access to credit resources that provide lifeline to our regimes. And that's where definitely China, once it manages to sort of stabilize the internal situation, uh, will definitely take stock of that at the time where the U.S. and Europe are so dysfunctional and absorbed in sorting out their domestic mess. And that's it for today. Thank you very much for listening. If you want to hear more from Alex Gabuev, check out his profile on the Carnegie website. He appears in many podcasts and events and regularly publishes on Russia, China, and geopolitics. And here's my recommendation for today. World Game by Bruno Massage. If you have followed our program over the last years, you may have encountered Bruno, who is a former Portuguese minister and really one of my favorite geopolitical thinkers. He's written a number of books, and he now has his own Substack newsletter called World Game. What I like about it is that it's often insightful, but also a little bit unpolished and note-like, so it's really a, a window into Bruno's thought process, and I find that tremendously enjoyable. If you like this episode, please make sure to subscribe so you don't miss any upcoming episodes. And do leave us a rating or review on iTunes. It really helps other people find the show. In our next episode, we will look at Switzerland's relationship with China and its recently published China strategy. This episode was produced and edited by Denise Staubli. My name is Nicolo Singer. See you soon. Follow Asia Society Switzerland on social media and visit our website for more information on upcoming events.